Welcome everybody for today's uh, webcast, Solutions for De Novo Genome Assembly. We're delighted to have you with us. You know about BioIT World, I think. Uh, today's uh, webinar is also jointly produced by, an, uh, by NGS Leaders, a sister organization of ours. It's an online community for people just like you working in next-gen sequencing, genomics, bioinformatics, and related fields. It currently has more than 3,000 members who've registered at ngsleaders.org and are able to join their colleagues and participate in a collaborative information ecosystem uh, to address emerging challenges and network with peers and so on. I blog there with some regularity and I strongly urge you to make contributions as well. We'd, we'd love to have a, a real dialogue going into your community. I'm going to keep my introduction very short because we're going to try to keep this to about 60 minutes or as close to there too as we can, and uh, it's important that you hear from the talent and not from not from me. So we're here to talk about the process and some ideas and strategies for selecting uh, the right tools and software for de novo complex genome assembly, which is obviously a critical undertaking, particularly given the ubiquity of uh, short read sequence data pouring off uh, second generation instruments. As you embark on complex genome projects, what are some of the key considerations uh, in terms of, for example, DNA library preparation or performing pilot sequencing projects before you get the main uh, project underway, uh, algorithm evaluation, IT storage requirements? These are just some of the key factors that you'll have to uh, consider if, uh, if this uh, project is going to prove to be a success. All of our uh, three guest speakers today have uh, expertise and opinions on some of these uh, ideas, and they're going to share their ideas, trends, and uh, some best practices in the field of complex genome assembly. Our webinar today is sponsored by DNA Star, and you'll be hearing uh, from uh, Matthew Kayser from DNA Star uh, a little bit later in the program. In the second slot is Josh Gross, an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati. But first, it's a pleasure to welcome back to uh, a BioIT World Web Symposium, Ian Korf. Uh, Ian is an associate professor in the Molecular and Cellular Biology Department at UC Davis, and associate director of bioinformatics at the uh, Affiliated Genome Center. He uh, literally wrote the book on BLAST and is, as many of you will know, a principal organizer of the Assemblathon, a competition designed to identify best practices in the de novo assembly of complex genomes. Uh, he has a PhD uh, from Indiana University in molecular cellular and developmental biology and a, a bachelor's degree in biology from Cornell. Ian, it's great to have you back. I'm going to uh, hand the microphone over to you. Thanks. It's good to be here, and uh, it's nice to see all these people with an interest in genome assembly. And hopefully what we can get them thinking about today is how to get doing that the right way, because there's lots of ways to do it the wrong way. So the title of my um, presentation is Genome Assembly Before and After, just some ideas about things you should be considering even before you start. Before. Okay, probably the first thing is money. People talk about the $1,000 genome, but one should not conf confuse that with how much it actually costs to do a new genome. It's going to be more than $1,000. Even if you could do something for $1,000, it probably wouldn't be very good. There's a lot of associated costs. Making your libraries, there's supplies there, and there's lots of time. Sequencing has supplies and time costs associated with it. The assembly, um, there's hardware, there's software, and there's time. And after the assembly, there's a lot more time than you thought. And time is really... People power costs more than supplies or computers or something like that, and so that's really where the costs lie. So when you're planning this, in the software world, people often double the amount of time it takes to do something. So you have some estimate that you could double it. You might do something like that, but um, you wouldn't want to underestimate these kinds of costs. Partnering. I would say that there's many more people with experience in genome sequencing and assembly than people who are listening here. So really, the first thing you should do is seek help. Probably the worst thing you can do is to do everything by yourself and then ask somebody later on to help you out of the mess that you made. It's very easy to do that. You can look at a, you know, you can come out of the say, seminar thinking, oh, I understand a lot of the things that are going on with sequence assembly so I can start doing things right away. And I would not do that. There are companies like DNA Star, there are sequencing centers like JGI or Broad or Sanger Center or whatever. Find somebody who's done this before and get their help. Don't go off on your own. That probably applies more than just sequence assembly, but definitely here. This, we're talking about a field that's very much research, it's very dynamic, and you want to get experts' opinions. Homozygous is better than heterozygous. Genome assemblers are designed for haploid genomes. The original assembly problems were not 
considering diploid genomes and the first genomes that were sequenced, like uh, some of the first complex eukaryotes, be they Saccharomyces cerevisiae or Cinerabdinus elegans, we're talking about genomes that are either haploid, essentially haploid, because they've been, they're true breeding. When you start working with a diploid, then you know it's, it's a slightly different case. The two chromosomes from your mom and your dad are not the same. And so what the, the assembly that you get out of that at the end of the day with this reference genome doesn't really exist. There is no genome that if you sequence my genome and you got a haploid genome out of it, it doesn't look like either part of my genome. And so there's going to be some parts where it looks like my mom and some parts it looks like my dad. And it's going to be confusing both to the assembler and to analyses afterwards. So anything you could do to make your sequences more homozygous would be a good thing. Heterozygosity can lead to splits where you have two sequences instead of one. And you can sort of find those things sometimes later on. We can talk about that later on. But know that, that this is an issue. Point four is DNA minus RNA is bad. Okay, so every genome project should also include a parallel RNA-seq project. It's not very expensive to do RNA-seq these days, so there's no reason not to do it. It could be used for assembly. There really aren't any genome assemblers that use RNA-seq information, but they could. There's no reason to not to scaffold contigs together by RNA-seq. That seems like an obvious thing to do, and none of the packages are really doing it right now, but you know, I would expect them to start doing that. So after you do your assembly, it's incredibly useful for assembly evaluation. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And you do need it later for genome annotation, as much as you might want to bank on previous proteins that have been annotated or gene prediction algorithms or something like that. Honestly, the best source of genome annotation information is going to come from aligning full-length transcripts or virtual full-length transcripts back to your genome. You always include RNA-seq in your, in your genome project. Alive is better than dead in, in pretty much everything, but you may need to sample your organism later on. You might want to go back, oh, I need more DNA, or I need more RNA, because now that I did my RNA-seq, I realize it's messed up, or I did a normalized one, and now I need a quantitative one, or vice versa. Well, if it's dead, it's going to be hard to do. And if you sample from a different organism that might be related, it could cause you problems in, in the assembly or analysis later on. So it's nice if you can get a big, giant organism that's still alive and you can go back to it later on. If you can't, sometimes things like an immortal, you know, like a cell line or something that's true breeding, Cinerabinus elegans, for example, these are good options for you. Possibly this isn't going to be the case. You might be in a situation where you've got a lot of heterozygosity and the samples, the things that you sample are die soon after you get them. Life will be harder if you do that. Understood that sometimes science is like that, but um, definitely if you, if you have some choice, try and keep the thing alive. IT considerations. Even before you start thinking about how do you assemble this thing, you got to think about how much RAM do I need in my computer, how much CPU do I need, what am I going to do about storage, what am I going to do about backup in case something catastrophic happens, and how am I going to distribute all this data to other people? Am I going to distribute it through just this little pipe that comes out of my lab or my university and then people are going to take days to download, or am I going to upload it to the cloud where everybody has access to it? It's something to solve. And it's one of those, these kinds of things are often not the thing to solve by yourself, but to be discussing with your partners who've done this before. Assembly software, there's lots of different assembly path software out there. You've got this and AllPaz, Amos, Solera, CLC, Miraculous, Nubler. There's a bunch of other ones. Seekman Engine is something that we're going to be hearing more about from DNA Star, Fusion, Soap De Novo, Velvet. There's probably 20 to 30 different programs out there that people will advertise as being sequence assembly software. And each one of them has different kinds of hardware together. Sequencing technologies. Boy, there's a lot of different sequencing technologies that are available now that are all um, Sanger. There are some projects that are small, and Sanger sequencing is still appropriate for that. But of course, 454 and Illumina and Solid and Ion Torrent all have some advantages because they have so much more sequence per dollar. And then there's things like PacBio and probably other third generation technologies that will become available soon that could be used as part of an assembly. Here's a chart that I have borrowed from the bioinformatics core director here, Ryan Kim, and this shows for various platforms some attributes of them, like how they amplify and their chemistry and such. One of the things that you might be interested in is uh, you can look at, you should probably come back and look at this later. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there are 
very different costs per base pair. But not every, it's not always cost per base pair that's the most important thing. When you're considering assembly, um, 100x of one technology might not be the, any better than 10x of another technology. This is one of those things where you want to discuss it with your partner of, who has been doing sequencing before and said, oh, we use a mixture of these kinds of things or this technology we like with this assembler. You'd be hard-pressed to want to solve this on your own. The only time you might want to try and do some of these things and solve something by, on your own is when somebody offers you an incredible deal and says, we'll do this stuff for free. And then, then you would take that and then you might add some other stuff to it. Sometimes you get those kinds of deals. So libraries, depending on your technology, you have different kinds of libraries. You might be in single reads or paired end reads or mate pairs or back ends or some kind of other thing with pooled thosmids might be the approach you'd use. So when we're running the assemblathon, one of the interesting discussions that we had was what, do, what next should we do? And one of the things that the assemblers really were interested in, which probably no, not many other people would be, just because of the cost involved, is they wanted to see a competition among different library practices. Boy, would that be expensive. They take a whole bunch of different libraries, preparation uh, methods, and then put them into the same assembler. They recognize how important those assemblers do. They recognize how important it is to have the libraries made well. And so that's why they would want to see that. It's not really appreciated all the time how hard it is to make the libraries. So a lot of effort can be spent there. And and they, it, it's one of these kinds of things in bioinformatics where we have garbage in, garbage out. So the things that are upstream most should be really high quality. So that would be things like your DNA preparations and the libraries that are made for those. Don't You don't want to skimp on those. When it comes to the actual assembly, you have to figure out which assembler plus sequencing technology plus library construction methods you will want to use, and it should be some kind of a mixture of those. Again, we discuss this with our assembly experts, and given some knowledge of our own genome of interest, every genome is unique, so you have to consider the properties of your genome. How big of your repeats do you have? How much segmental duplication? How much heterozygosity? All of those things go into this very complex equation. And I just want to say one more time, don't think you can solve it yourself. Don't forget to assemble your RNA-seq transcripts because everybody's going to be doing that as well, I'm sure. So what do we do after this magical assembly process? The first thing you do is investigate your genes. So a good assembly will contain complete genes. It should be kind of obvious. One way you can find out if you've got complete genes is to look at your RNA-seq transcripts. You can assemble those transcripts. They would be complete genes, align them back to their genome, and they should be there completely. If you're missing them, that's probably they've got holes in your genome assembly. You can also look for core genes. A research project in my lab we have does this. It's a pro product we call Segma, and this is something that we use to find genes that are in every organism. And if, there, if your organism is missing these genes, it's a hole in the assembly. There are assemblies out there where you can find where they're missing some of the core genes. There's even assemblies out there where the one from one version of the assembly to the next. The assembly has supposedly got better, but they dropped genes out, so it's actually not as good. So when you're figuring out if your assembly is any good, one of the things you want to focus is on how many genes did you find. You also want to investigate read depth. There's areas that may be excessively deep. You may have sequenced to 50x, and you find some regions that are 5,000x deep. Those would be areas that contain repeats. Sometimes the repeats are at relatively low copy number, and they're hard to classify as as repeats, but you'll have segmental duplications and other things that will increase your read depth. If you have a lot of copies, you should probably build a repeat library from those so you can look for those specifically. Areas that are too shallow can be due to heterozygosity, definitely, but it also could be due to sequencing ascertainment bias. Either somewhere in the sequencing process, you sometimes get um, sequences that drop out. For example, high GC regions sometimes are highly underrepresented, and so and sometimes those are the most interesting parts of the genome. Uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about that, but understand that that could happen. But you might want to reassemble your genome. You don't want to do it necessarily just once. You can adjust assembly parameters within your specific program and try it again, or you could change assembly programs and try again. You could consider adding a different kind of sequencing data, perhaps even working entirely with Illumina, and you decide maybe you know maybe you should add some pack bio into that, and you can do that. One of the things you don't want to do is optimize for N50. N50 is just an artificial kind of metric of how good your assembly is, and it doesn't really correlate well with how good your assembly is. You really want to be looking for that you have the genes that you expect to be there, and maybe if you're interested in, in like looking at SNPs and stuff, that you have a low error rate. And you can do that by looking at the realignments. Two more th features here. One is to annotate your genome. Genome annotation is probably more complicated 
than genome assembly. And so this is another case where you want to partner with some experts. Those experts might be somebody at Ensemble or maybe the NCBI, or it might be Mark Gandel who had developed the Maker software. There's a lot of people out there who will be doing genome annotation who have done it before, so partner with them. And it's really fun if you have a big community, if you host an annotation jamboree, so that you can look at all that stuff together, and this can feed back on both assembly and more annotation later. You do have to share your data. Well, hopefully you do anyhow. You, obviously you don't have to, but it, you know, genome information is leveraging that by comparison is, is a very powerful kind of approach. So the old-fashioned way to be just to host these on FTP or HTTP or some other service to allow other people to download them. Another possibility is, to, is to say, say, instead of saying, hey, download this to your computer, is to put it in the cloud and give other people access to the cloud so that they can start analyzing on somebody else's computer. This is much nicer for people who are in the third world, for, for example. Also, hosting your data on a genome browser is a great way for people to look at it. Um, the last part, point I want to make is to maintain what you've got. Don't let the genome sequence and annotation become stale. It can definitely happen and has happened. Um, you want to encourage community feedback and allow the community to edit it in some way so that these kinds of, so it, it's always up to date. It's, um, genome assemblies are rarely finished products when they come out of the labs, and so thinking about how you're going to maintain that in the future is really important. Okay, I'd like to end there. Ian, thank you very much. Uh, great way to start the program. I'm going to quickly slip in a couple of questions here that we had uh, from the audience while you were speaking. This will be common knowledge to many of the people in the audience, but what did you mean by N50? N50 is a measure for what an assembly looks like. What you do is you sort your contigs. So after doing an assembly, you're going to get a whole bunch of contigs coming out. You're not, I mean, in the ideal world, you would get one contig per chromosome. But what really happens is they get fragmented. It repeats heterozygous regions, etc. So you have this big list of contigs, and they have various sizes. So you sort that list from largest to smallest, and you go to where the you start marching down from the biggest to the smallest. And when you've reached half the sum of the entire assembly, that is your N50 length. What's the length of the contig that represents when you've come halfway through all of it? So usually that number is, it depends on, on your assembly method, but sometimes people try and optimize for that. And one way to optimize for that is just to throw out all the small stuff. If you throw out all the small contigs, then you can push your N50 up higher because the middle, effectively, of your list becomes a larger contig. But that may end up losing you genes. Okay. Were you uh, referring mostly in your remarks to eukaryotic genomes, or could many of your remarks also apply to bacterial de novo genome projects? That's a good question. Genome mostly what I'm talking about is eukaryotic genome projects. Mm -hmm. Bacterial genome projects are a little different because you have, with these new next generation sequencers, probably way too much sequence to assemble, and so a lot of the times you would be doing that in some kind of metagenomic kind of setting, and that's a completely different problem because the sequences there are very different copy number, et cetera. So I'm really focusing on this on eukaryotic. Okay. And finally, for now, before we bring in Josh, second speaker, to just say a little bit about the Assemblathon, uh, Ian. Uh, you mentioned it in passing, but there may be some people in the, in the audience who are familiar with what you've done there and where they can find some of the first tranche of results. There is a website, assemblathon.org, that shows what we're working on in the project. Uh, Assemblathon 1 has been completed. That was using synthetic simulated data. And Assemblathon 2 has three different organisms, a fish, a uh, bird, and a snake that is um, actual real data. And we're still in the middle of analyzing that um, data. So, but, and we welcome people to, to join in on that if they like. And people who are building new assembly algorithms can go and get that data and try it out themselves. There's a number of different projects that are trying to assess um, genome assembly. This is one of several. OK. And uh, the first paper was published recently in Genome Research. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much for now, uh, Ian. Let's uh, welcome our second speaker, Josh Gross, who is an assistant professor of biological sciences at the University of Cincinnati, where his research centers on the genetic analysis of morphological traits in uh, the rather exotic Mexican cave fish. Josh received his uh, MS in biology from the University of Denver, and he holds a PhD in organismic and evolutionary biology from Harvard Medical School. Josh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to, to the BioIT World Web Symposium and NGS Leaders Web Symposium program. Take it away. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. It's, a, it's certainly a pleasure to, to present here. 
particularly after that very nice uh, presentation by Ian. So I'm, I'm going to kind of switch gears here a little bit by, I, I, again, going back a little bit more to an organismal perspective. So as Kevin mentioned, I study the blind Mexican cavefish. For today, I'm going to sort of begin by talking a bit about this model system, talk a little bit about the historical analyses that have kind of laid the groundwork for really where we were maybe two, three years ago, discuss the genetic and genomic resources that we were able to acquire up to that point. And I'll sort of make the pitch that we more or less hit a, a little bit of a brick wall. And I'll talk about our, our own de novo transcriptome analysis that was really initiated just about a year ago this time, and then talk a little bit about the work that we've been able to pull out of it. So, so this is my system. As Kevin mentioned, it is definitely an exotic organism. We find these fish in the northeastern part of Mexico in a series of limestone caves. So you might be able to appreciate the, this series of mountain ranges that you see right here. There are a couple of riv rivers and streams. As you move into this uh, region of Mexico, one, one encounters this is uh, sort of the cave entrance. Okay, so this is this is a picture, a picture taken of the Tanaha Cave just about a year ago this time. And you enter into this cave, you walk for about an hour and a half, and at the very end, of, of this uh, sort of cave tunnel, you reach a cave pool. Uh, you can see this little organism right here. Here's a hand for scale, and this is my organism in its natural habitat. So they live in very clear freshwater pools that are very, very nutrient-poor regions of, of the caves. And this is really a, a fascinating model system because irrespective of the fact that uh, this this fish here, called the, that I'm naming Molino, really for the name of the cave uh, where this fish was collected, and this uh, fish here, Pachon, from the Pachon Cave here, are actually from from entirely have been derived from entirely different uh, ancestral stock. So the fish that colonized this cave here probably colonized the Pachon region roughly two to three million years prior to the epigean or surface uh, stream dwelling fish that colonized this cave here. Um, but you can see that there's a remarkable, remarkable amount of convergence on the cave phenotype. And in fact, this is not something that's present just in cave fish. So whether you're a freshwater fish from Mexico or a freshwater crustacean from southern Slovenia, uh, there's, there seems to be something about colonization into the cave environment wherein one loses a normal light-dark cycle and experiences a very nutrient-poor environment that leads to the evolution of both constructive and regressive phenotypic changes. So really my lab is interested in trying to get at the underlying genetic basis for these regressive and constructive traits. Now historically, we've really been limited to largely classical studies. So this is a graph taken from, excuse me, a data set taken from a paper published in 1969, wherein in cross number eight, these investigators explored a heterozygous cross between sibling F1s derived from cave and surface form individuals. So they created 13, over 1,300 individuals, and they were able to assess the relative phenotypic distribution within their cross. So uh, whether it was albinism or another, uh, what we know now to be a recessive monogenic trait or uh, brown, uh, both of these seem to parse out as very simple Mendelian traits. So what about the genes that underlie these traits? Well, this really motivated a series of QTL studies uh, that were initiated in about 2000, 2001 by Meredith Protus, who was able to construct the first generation Astyanx linkage map. Uh, so what you can see here on the left is schematically uh, a number of different genomic markers that are arrayed along linkage group number 11 in Astyanx. And what we later found was that many of these markers seem to be arrayed along, and, and, and I should say the flanking genetic sequence seem, seem to be arrayed al along the same chromosome in Danio. And so you can then go back and infer a critical region on the Danio genome to help focus your search for candidate genes, and albinism is a, a nice gene to, excuse me, a nice trait to work with because there are really just a limited number of candidate genes that we know to mediate albinism in vertebrates. And lo and behold, OCA2 ended up being the gene that was responsible for albinism in this species. And in fact, interestingly, it occurs uh, recurrently, irrespective of different cave populations that were that, that have arisen at very different geologic times in the past. The QTL studies were phenomenal and and were really helpful for looking at 
very simple traits. Um, so monogenic traits like brown and albinism, but what about some of the more complex traits that we happen to see segregating within our F2 individuals? And, and there, there are certainly many. So one, one nice example is eye size. Now, the, the problem is that we did, it, did not really, as of a couple of years ago, have much in the way of uh, sequence data. So at the time that we initiated this project, there were only 48 known genes that had been accessioned to NCBI's database. Um, so we decided to take on a transcriptome project about a year ago this time. Rather than trying to go after the genome for many of the nice reasons that Ian outlined in his talk, um, we decided to go for a transcriptome because uh, both financially and, and with respect to our, our own skill set, it seemed like a better choice. Uh, so what we did is we isolated messenger RNA, excuse me, total RNA pools from which um, mRNA was derived from four fish. We used two surface form individuals, two cave form individuals. And within each of those two morphotype categories, we, we had one male and one female. So you'll immediately notice that this is a very, very low diversity pool that we selected from. But nonetheless, this turned out to be um, very helpful for us in some of our downstream applications. And so we partnered with a company to produce normalized cDNA libraries and uh, subjected our, our cDNA libraries to Roach 454 pyro sequencing. We were able to generate an enormous amount of data and then subsequently align through a de novo transcriptome assembly project using SeqMan and Gen through, uh, through DNA Star. And this ultimately provided us 22, uh, over 22,000 contig, so a very, uh, a very rich data set. And we actually started off with a couple of different assembly approaches. So the first, the first approach was actually to just assemble based on all of our uh, surface sequences. Um, and I should just say that we, we barcoded the surface versus the cave RNA pools so that we could go back and, and sort of deconvolute our, our data ex post facto. And so they, that sort of demonstrated up here in our alignment where you can see two surface reads along with uh, several patchone or, or cave uh, individual reads. So as I said, this produced uh, about one and a half million sequences, over, uh, nearly uh, 23,000 um, contigs. And we've taken on a couple of different post-transcriptome analyses strategies. We're currently utilizing Blast2Go. Um, however, our, our first approach was to use really just a homegrown kind of search and destroy, uh, so to speak, approach where uh, I had a couple of undergrads taking contigs and just querying the NCBI database, collecting information around the top, the top uh, Blast hit as demonstrated here, and then assembling these into our own uh, catalog and um, since that time, since about April of last year, we've now completed the entire catalog, so we, so we now have a top hit, um, as well as positional information within the Daniel Rario genome, the, ze the zebrafish genome, um, which is good for us because it, it allows us to understand the relative position of a gene in astyanx uh, within the physical genome of, an or of a closely re relatively closely related organism that does have a sequence genome like zebrafish. And it's also even stimulated some specific work on candidate genes that, that, uh, that mediate traits that are known to be present in cave-dwelling organisms. So, so for our assembly, we utilized, as I said, cave fish. We about 800, a little bit over 800,000 of our reads um, were derived from the cave form, that assembled into about 15,000 contigs. The surface fish assembly utilized about 700,000. We don't know why there's a discrepancy between these two values. Nonetheless, this returned about 13,000 contigs. Um, but then when we threw both sort of sets of data together into our assembly, it greatly enhanced the number of contigs that we had, and it even increased our depth coverage as well as the average contig length. And so it, uh, it, it certainly has been the best approach to utilize an integrated assembly. So this is what our data set looks like. This is actually a, a, a photograph from uh, the SeqMan NGen output itself. Uh, so what my undergraduate students did is she was able to generate a catalog of uh, each of these contigs themselves in a separate Excel file that even has a URL hyperlink to the top hit in Danio itself, as well as a series of other uh, quality control metrics that we were able to keep track of and then run descriptive statistics off of. Um, so of our descriptive statistics, really the what, what, one of the main things that I'll focus on here is just contig length. So. Um, if you look at the next slide here, what we did is essentially just 
um, array each of our contigs from 1 to 22596 by length, and you can see the, the sort of distribution of a few very enormous contigs as well as uh, sort of trailing off to um, a, a much smaller set, but but the average really hovering right there about 1.4 KB, which is very good, which we're very pleased with. So where did our blast hits land? The majority of them, so if you look here at this pie chart for the top 30 represented hits, the majority of our hits came from Danio Rario, which we would expect. Again, this is the most closely related organism to Astyanax mexicanus that does have a uh, sequence genome as well as uh, an array of other organisms, teleast fish, including salmon, uh, catfish and, and fugu, for example. The pattern doesn't really change much if you sort of bump up to the top 120 or so represented hits from our blast X. So, so now that we have assembled our transcriptome, what, what good is it? Well, for us, one of the main things that we wanted to do was to improve our genetic map, our linkage map. And so uh, we, we knew from the beginning that we, that we wanted to have a database that we could kind of query for the search of uh, relevant SNPs. And this idea uh, is an extension off of some work that I did back in 2008 where we demonstrated that the linear arrangement of anonymous markers, so mic microsatellite markers and a couple of candidate genes demonstrated here, uh, on a linkage group in Astyanax really demonstrate a very nice amount of synteny, not, not just to Daniel Rario, the cl a closely related fish, but some uh, even more distantly related fish that do have um, uh, sequenced uh, genomes. And so one of the things that we kept track of, a, a, as I said, as we, were, as we were querying our database was the number, excuse me, the relative position of hits within the Danio genome. So shown here on the bottom are each of the 25 different chromosomes in Danio and uh, the frequency of hits that we were able to get. And you can see that it's not uh, sort of an even number, but what we did find is that we get a, a, a fairly nice correlation between the number of map viewer hits that we were able to find per Daniel chromosome from our Astyanax assembly and the number of genes that are present on each chromosome. And so we feel that this is another nice sort of proof of concept piece of information that helps to really pr provide support for the quality of the transcriptome. So then next we went through and uh, essentially took our catalog and, and uh, organized it based on the position of our genes within Danio. So say we were interested in identifying genes present on chromosome 1, we would just go through, highlight those genes present on chromosome 1, take the relative position, and then ask if we can map them to uh, sort of syntenic regions within Astyanax as a way to focus our search for candidate genes. So this is an example taken from a gene called tubulin alpha-1c. Uh, shown here on the left is just the coverage distribution. So uh, shown here are all of our all of the reads from our 454 uh, project and where they mapped uh, along the contig itself. And you can see that the the depth is a little bit uh, stronger here than it is here, but nonetheless we have pretty decent coverage. Now, if we query for conflicts, we can reveal those regions that show a sequence alterations. Um, it actually turns out that in DNA star you can you can get a nice report of putative SNPs. We went through and did it the old-fashioned way where we just went to our contig itself, looked for variable SNPs, and then simply went through. The, and, and I'm just demonstrating here another uh, method for identifying uh, those SNPs very quickly using DNA Star software program and essentially designed primers to amplify and then query those SNPs in mass. Uh, so we have we have done that utilizing the Broad Institute. Uh, we have just genotyped about 1,000 markers in about 400 individuals, and it's turned out to be extremely successful. So we are very happy to report that almost all of the markers that we identified from our transcriptome assembly have been informative and uh, are sort of in the process of being placed to our next, our second generation linkage map. So this, in the, this is an example of our SNP calls for a SNP that would be homozygous A in a K form individual, homozygous C in the surface form individual, and then as we would predict in F1 individuals, the, they are heterozygous for that variable SNP, and then we see a very nice segregation in F2 individuals. And so based on recombination frequency, we're going to be able to place these to our linkage map without much trouble. Um, and so Really, this represents a fairly significant improvement because uh, as of about 2008, really only 68 of our 228 genomic markers, uh, which again were, I, were uh, anonymous markers, so these, these were based on microsatellites, were able to be placed, whereas now we've been able to handpick about 350 markers of known, identi of known, known identity, including positional identity, 
in Danny Orario and, and place those to our linkage map. So it's really going to be an enormous help for our uh, subsequent uh, QTL studies and association analyses. So in summary, what we've been able to do is take this figure, about 48 astyanic sequences, and really add to that nearly 23,000 contigs some of which are overlapping, but certainly over 20,000 genes for which sequence information had not yet been published or made available through national uh, database centers. So it really does represent an enormous expansion of the available resources for the SDNX community. I haven't shown this, but we've been able to already identify a number of different candidate genes involved in ongoing projects in my lab, looking at the biology of pigmentation loss and uh, the evolution of relaxed circadian rhythms. We've been able to identify genetic differences, coding sequence alterations in genes of known pleiotropic effect, as well as validation of many of these uh, sequence alterations using uh, traditional Sanger um, sequencing methods. And uh, furthermore, we've been able to identify a large number of SNPs uh, that have been included into a recent gen genotypic study that are very soon going to be placed to our latest generation linkage map and really facilitate higher resolution uh, association studies, as well as hopefully higher resolution phylogeographic studies that until now have really centered on just um, a few different genes. And utilizing this data set, we are going to be able to now move forward with some RNA sequencing analyses, which are currently underway. So I think I'll finish there by putting up some acknowledgments, acknowledgments here, and I'd like to specifically acknowledge Allison, who is a very bright undergraduate student in my lab, who really spearheaded a lot of this early work with the transcriptome. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Josh. I mean, interesting that because you're working, and you acknowledge them a couple of times at DNA Star. I'm just curious, did you find them or did they find you? That's a good question. I, I actually learned a lot of molecular biology and DNA sequencing analysis, in particular during my postdoc. And the available software that we had there was DNA Star Laser Gene. And so the project really evolved out of interactions and conversations that I had had with the folks at, at DNA Star. And to be honest, I was very nervous about being able to, with my background, being able to take on something that seemed as bioinformatically exhausting as a transcriptome assembly. But, you know, really, the, as Ian mentioned in his portion of the talk, getting help from the folks at LaserGene has really been key for having the success that we've had, I think. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. Stay, stay on the line. We got we bombarded with questions, which we will try to get to uh, in a few minutes at the end of the, the third and final presentation for today. Uh, Matthew Kayser is a next-gen application scientist for DNA Star. I think he's been with them for with the company for about seven years. His prime role is assisting scientists manage sequence assembly and analysis challenges, including de novo genome assembly, obviously, and many other genomics requirements besides. Uh, Matthew, thanks to DNA Star for sponsoring today's web, webcast, and um, take it away. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. I'm glad everyone could join us this afternoon, uh, quite a number of people. And again, thanks to Ian and Josh for some uh, very good insight into de novo assemblies. What I'd like to do today is just give you a little background to DNA Star, the company, and then actually demonstrate a de novo assembly workflow of setting up a project and then some of the analysis tools that we offer. And of course, I'm here, one of my roles here at DNA Star is to answer questions that customers have and, and support them throughout their project. And so we'll get a chance at the end here for you to, to ask me some questions. So, so DNA Star is a company located in Madison, Wisconsin. It looks nothing like this today, I guarantee you. It's much colder. We go back a long ways. We've been doing de novo assemblies and generating software to do assemblies and analysis for over 15 years. And I'd like to point out that we have, uh, here's a science paper from 1997 where our owner, Dr. Fred Blattner, uh, had sequenced the uh, E. coli genome. So he was a pioneer in genomics. And many of our tools from way back in the 1990s uh, and continuing all the way through to the current time uh, are developed for molecular biologists. So we make tools that run on desktop computers, as easy to use as possible, and then we try to support it as well as we can. So, you know, if you're, if you're a newbie and you're just starting your first project, you know, we can, we can help you out to get started, you know, to troubleshoot and get you on your way uh, with the software. And so our software that we're going to talk about today is our Seekman Eng Engine Assembly software. And then we'll also look at the Seekman software that we use to view the projects. The Engine Assembler runs on 64-bit computers, Mac, PC, and Linux. And it, it produces very high-quality 
a contig. So in, in a de novo assembly, quality means everything. And I think Ian had mentioned that the N50 value is, is vastly overused, I think. And really, it's the quality of those contigs that, that matter the most. So we'll look at some of the tools in Seekman. Our software, again, it's desktop software uh, for under $5,000. You can you know invest and have an assembler and analysis software. And of course, your support with all purchases. Uh, the different types of data, we assemble Illumina, Ion, Torrent, Roche 454, and Pack Bio data. We'll look at some of these data sets and uh, some of the specific parameter settings that we'll have for each each platform. And some of these different data sets are different types of data. It's a little bit confusing sometimes between what folks are talking about, whether it be single end or paired end data or mate paired data. And we try to support as many types of data as possible. Uh, with the Ion Torrent platform, uh, we support their single end data. We've recently received paired end data. They'll have a module, uh, I think this quarter, where we'll have pair data that can be used for error correction. And then, of course, mate pair data, which is also new for ion torrent data, with larger insert sizes. And we'll look at one of those data sets today. And, of course, Illumina has been in the market for quite a while, so they have single end short inserts as well as mate pairs and 454 uh, with their mate pair data. And we're just starting to become uh, compatible with PacBio. We'll have a release here this spring that offers PacBio support as well. So one of the first questions that will come up, uh, especially with, with new customers, is you know, how powerful can this software be? If it's designed to run on a desktop computer, does that really limit you know, the things that you can do and the types of assemblies that you can do? These are actually benchmarks for reference-guided assemblies. But just to give you an idea, this has a, a, been a focus for the last year and a half or so. And we set out to develop a human genome desktop assembler uh, that could, that could you know, on a relatively modest computer, assemble several billion reads at deep coverage in under 24 hours. And so we have that assembly capability, and then we also have the analysis tools that I can look at this genome on my laptop and do all the analysis that I need. And, and so these are some really fast reference-guided times. Now, I should point out that oftentimes in a de novo assembly, um, there's actually iterations between doing a de novo, closing some gaps, and then using those contigs that you have as reference sequences as in confirmation assemblies. So a lot of times you, you alternate between reference guided and de, and de novo as you, as you close those gaps. So it's, it's important to have this fast assembler as well. Uh, the de novo assembler that we use um, is more RAM dependent. And so um, we, we generally focus on microbial genomes, de novo transcriptomes, and we have some customers that do smaller eukaryotic genomes. Again, it is dependent on RAM, so you have to have enough RAM available for the amount of data that you are assembling. There really aren't great benchmarks for de novo assemblies. We can look at the, the N, Contig N50 and approximately how long it takes. But really, the important part is how accurate are the contigs that you're forming? And can you take these contigs and create accurate scaffolds? And do you have an interface that you can work with the scaffold and close gaps? and do the annotations that you need to do. So th there's actually been a couple papers in BMC Genomics that compared our Seekman engine assembler to a variety of open source and commercial softwares. And this involved both 454 de novo assembly and Illumina de novo assembly. And from both papers, there's some very nice comments about Seekman engine. It was you know, overall the best performer. It had the most novel transcript sequences. And in the case of 454, either Nubler or Seekman Engine produced the best results. And we like to show uh, you know, this, uh, these papers because de novo transcriptome can be really one of the most difficult kinds of de novo assemblies. It can be very complex mixes of sequences with super abundant targets and some rare targets. And it requires the de novo assembler to be very, very stringent to give you the best possible uh, assemblies. So these papers, we can you, again, you can get from our, our website or BMC Genomics. Now, what I'd like to do now is actually go and take a look at the software. Seekman Engine has a, a we, we call it a wizard, but it's a project setup tutorial. And there's six to seven different pages. And the idea here is to make setting up projects as, as easy as possible. Now, for those of you that, that have used open source software or a variety of different assemblers, um, you know that there's a very steep learning curve if you're at a facility that might use Ion Torrent and Illumina, and you're doing both de novo and reference guided assemblies. And to do that using open source tools can be extremely difficult, and it can be very difficult to optimize each program to give the best possible results. 
Uh, the Seekman engine interface provides a lot of flexibility so that you can hopefully make simple decisions and that will guide you through the project setup. So we'll start here with creating a new assembly project. And we can pick different types of projects. Uh, we support genome assemblies, exome and resequencing, transcriptome assemblies, and metagenomic assemblies. Now, for, for example, if you're doing a microbial genome, you might pick between a genome assembly. You might actually do a metagenomic assembly prior to um, trying to assemble a single genome. A common question might be, you know, is there a reference sequence out there that is best for my data set? Our metagenomic assembler is really a sorter. It can take sequence data and sort to thousands of reference genomes if needed, and you can identify uh, which genome in a mixed population matches yours most closely. So you might do that first and then find the best reference sequence and go down a, um, a hybrid de novo reference guided assembly. Otherwise, you can pick a de novo, uh, de novo assembly as well. So if I take the genome, uh, the genome pathway, I can take a de novo assembly route. If I do have a reference that's, that's close, I might choose to use that reference to guide my assembly. And there's often, oftentimes a decision. It's not clear if the reference is better or a de novo approach is better. With Engine, you can just try both, look at the end result, and then make your decision whether or not to use that reference to help guide or just to go all de novo. And so the output then with the de novo or this reference guided will be a Seekman project file that's fully editable. And so we can pick a project name, an output folder. We can save the project as a Seekman format, which is a fully editable format, but it does have limitations. 10 million is pretty conservative. I, I've stretched this to 20 million in some cases, but that does limit the size of the project that we can assemble and save in the editable Seekman format. We have developed a BAM, a de novo BAM format. This was new last fall. The de novo BAM format has all the advantages of the regular BAM format in that I can have projects virtually of any size and the memory footprint is quite small. So it's a very promising format for large assemblies. So as we look to the future, we hope to develop more capability within this format for large de novo assemblies. Now the input sequence files, the read technology really sets many of the um, default parameters. And again, if, you're, if you have more than one sequencing platform or you receive data from more than one platform, it can be difficult to know the optimal parameters. Uh, once a customer or a user sets the technology, then we know quite a bit about the project. We know it's a de novo genome now, it's ion torrent data, there's certain error profiles of this data, and, and the algorithm will flex a bit to be optimal for this data set. We can add both unpaired reads, and this is in their SFF format, and also some, this is some brand new data from ion torrent. This is some 10 kb mate pair data um, that they've recently generated. The read options, these are just some more, to, uh, more adjustments that I can make with my data. If I have transcriptome data, I may very well need to trim heavily. So I might have vectors or contaminants. I can trim those out. Many more options here. We don't have time to go into great detail. But these are all fine-tuning options to trim my data prior to assembling it. Then, then there's some additional assembly options. I have an expected genome length that helps with the repeat handling. Uh, I can do things like set the match percentage, which really sets the overall stringency of my assembly. We have a, a default value here that we've optimized for this particular data type. But you might have an instance where you want to try to be more stringent or less stringent. For de novo genome assemblies, usually the best thing to do is to sacrifice Contig N50 a bit and have a more stringent assembly. You know, assemble at a higher match percentage. Your Contigs may be a little smaller, but it really will reduce things like false joins that can be very difficult to identify and remove downstream. You know, if you get too far along your annotation work and gap closure and find that you have errors in the Contigs, that, that creates a lot more headache and a lot more work for you. So I often recommend to try a couple different stringencies, you know, all the way up to 95 down to 85, and evaluate some of your contigs to see what quality is best and then proceed from that point. Uh, we can also remove the smallest contigs from the assembly. Usually we don't try to scaffold the really small contigs, and certain data types like Illumina can yield many very small contigs. We can call those out. 
Uh, then there's more options here. won't go into all these details, but uh, we can use these to fine-tune an assembly. Again, that's where our support comes in. If you want to optimize something, you contact me. We can look at your results and maybe make an adjustment to optimize. Uh, once we set all these parameters, we have the, the last kind of page here on our wizard. And what we see is a, is a script of instructions now. And this is the instructions that the assembler follows uh, to run this particular assembly. Advanced users might find it more beneficial to run the software just from the command line. So they can take this script file, drag and drop it into the command line, and run up an assembly without even using this uh, user interface. The advantage there, of course, is that you could take multiple scripts or use a table to adjust variables and run many assemblies overnight or over the weekend to, to keep up with the throughput that you, that you might need. When we click Assemble, we can see what versions of software we have, the workflow that we have, and usually when I run an assembly, I'll watch this for, for a little bit just to see that everything is loading properly. If there's an error here, we'll see that in the log, and that's something I can send to DNA Star to help troubleshoot. Um, now, when this is finished, uh, we'll get the option to launch the Assemble project directly in Seekman. Okay, so Seekman is one of the modules in the LaserGene Core Suite. The LaserGene Core Suite is uh, the software that we've sold for 20 plus years. Many of you probably already have access to LaserGene. So our existing customers, as they move into next gen and have larger, uh, larger projects, they might add the Seekman Engine Assembler. The output then can feed directly into Seekman for them to do their analysis. And so we get a, a couple different things here. We have um, a report file. This gives me the output and a summary of the assembly. And this, is, again, is a great place for troubleshooting. I'll have customers send me the report. If there's a problem, I can usually see something in here uh, to help them out. What we get then is, a, is a, this window that I'm bringing to the front is a list of contigs then that have assembled in this de novo assembly. And usually what I do is some editing. I'll look at the big contig, suspicious that there could be a false join there, and I'll scan through the, um, the pair information. And once I'm convinced that, that I have a stringent assembly with accurate contigs, I'll order them into scaffolds, and that's just a menu item here, order contigs. The algorithm will read the pair data and then place the contigs into scaffolds according to the pair information that's present. Um, this is some brand new ion torrent data, so it's really exciting to kind of uh, see what some of this new technology can yield. I've also brought in some annotations, and so I blasted some of the contigs, and you can see here, it's kind of a rolling batch blast. I can see which contig I have and look at the description and get things like the query coverage and find hits that are the strongest to my contigs. And once I do that, I can actually click a button here and collect the features from that particular GenBank sequence. And that helps me to do some auto annotation then on my, on my contigs. And once I bring those annotations in, and then look at one of my scaffolds. I get lots of useful information here. So this is a scaffold 300. It is, this is an E. coli assembly. And I'm just scrolling here. You can see this is 1.2 megabases. So it's about a quarter of the whole genome now is in, is in this one scaffold. And what we're looking at here is lots of, lots of great information. There's a depth of coverage histogram. So it shows me the coverage that I have across the contig a pair consistency histogram that tells me, do I have lots of, it just basically summarizes the amount of pair information that I have in this contig. You can see a gap here, and then the next contig is contig 310. Below, here's a list of the features then that I brought in my blast hits. So it displays these annotations then on my contig, and in this lower window is, is a place that it's really kind of a nice working surface. This shows me all the sequence data that is comprised in these contigs. And so there's a key here. I can show all the data. This shows me all the reads. Or I can filter it down and say, well, just show me these blue reads. And these are the reads that stretch from one contig to a neighboring contig. And they're really the, the reads that were used to order the scaffolds. And I can go to a small view like this. And here I can see at this gap, I have massive amounts of pair information to support the order of these contigs. And it's this visualization that gives me lots of confidence that I have accurate contigs accurate scaffolds, and then I can proceed on. And the next steps now, I won't go through all these steps because we don't have nearly enough time, but if I just go to the contig menu, many of these different contig editing functions, things like locking contigs down, 
reassembling, aligning them, aligning them end to end, extending ends. These are all macro editing tools. It allows me to start to do things like gap closure. And so the next step, at least for this project, might be to focus on a gap. I can lock everything else down and preserve the order and then focus on these two contigs and figure out you know, what piece goes in between those um, contigs to close that gap. And that goes through a series of, course, of gap uh, closing steps that are, are beyond uh, the scope of the webinar here today. I do want to show you one, one other, the last couple minutes here. Let me just go to Seekman Engine again. And so if I do pick transcriptome assembly uh, and then go to a de novo transcriptome assembly, it's, it's really the same selections that I would make with the de novo genome assembly, except there are differences in the algorithm with respect to things like repeat handling. And so I can, I can still run a, an engine assembly, very easily set up a de novo transcriptome assembly, and get output from that de novo transcriptome assembly that will be, you know, it might be 10,000, it could be 100,000 contigs. And transcriptome assemblies in particular can be very, very challenging because they, they can have many different isoforms that are similar to each other. I can set parameters to either separate them or cluster them together. And once I have these clusters, we can do things like the rolling batch blast again. So the, the batch blast then allows me to bring in annotations. And so here is a strategy view now of a single, a single cluster, a single mRNA. I've imported annotations. I can see my coverage plot across. And I also have a feature list now that I've imported for this, for this transcript. And so the same kind of tools then we can use, you know, the de novo genome with a de novo transcriptome analysis that can be very beneficial. And from some of the earlier speakers today, it's very useful to have this transcriptome data along with the, the genome data. You can use transcript data to verify the accuracy of, of genomic contig assemblies. And there's a very good idea that I've heard a couple times recently, uh, you know, the possibility of taking an assembled de novo transcript and mapping it back to a genome assembly to try to use the exons to scaffold um, gene sequences together. And that's something that I'd like to discuss with some of the developers and see uh, what the possibilities are there. So I guess a couple more things just to mention here. Some future developments. We're working on multiple different ways to improve de novo assembly. One thing that we are discussing now is, is an improved large capacity de novo assembly algorithm. Our current algorithm is RAM limited. So as your projects get larger, you need more and more RAM that can go beyond what's typical on a desktop computer. We're looking to develop algorithms that are not memory limited, but give very good results in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, we'd also have begun work on an editable de novo BAM file format. There's really two big hurdles for working with large genomes on desktop computers. One is the assembly. One is what do you do with that assembly once you have all the assembled contigs? And we feel that the BAM file format is ideal. However, editability is not part of the native BAM format. We'd like to add some of that editability uh, to the format so that you can work in BAM mode and not be restrained by, by file size. We also are looking at some automated genome closure and annotation. For certain genomes that are well characterized, where you might know what the repeats are, uh, we, can, we have ways that we think we can annotate automatically and close some of the gaps in a more automated fashion. And then we're also doing some current work with improved utilization of multiple pair insert sizes during de novo assembly. Um, there's, there's always room for improvement there, and that's, that's something we feel that, that we can do. So again, thanks for joining us this afternoon, and I see lots of questions pouring in, so I will try to get back to all of you with all the questions that I see. Matthew, thank you very much indeed. That concludes the third of our three presentations for today's webinar. And since we've just gone over the 60-minute mark, I'll completely understand if some of you have to uh, drop off, in which case we thank you very much for attending, and we thank DNA staff for their support and our speakers. If you can stick around for the next 10 minutes, we've been swamped with questions. We'll try to get through as many of them as we can with the, the, the blessing of our speakers, if they can just hang around for a little bit more, although I know they've been doing a sterling job of trying to respond to people individually on the chat box, and so some of them may have some of these may already have been answered. Matthew, let me just take the last question first. What are you doing in the cloud? Does a Seekman engine run in the cloud? It's not something that we've really set up. Uh, we do have a, a, a mini cloud that we, we have for demos where customers that do not have hardware in place can 
access uh, Seek Command Engine uh, from a remote computer. But yeah, it's, we've really focused on, on local desktop computing and feel that, that as desktop computers get more powerful, like, like with the reference guided human genome assembly, we, th we think that we can solve you know, de novo genome assemblies on fairly basic desktop computers. Questions came in right from the beginning when Ian was speaking. Um, so Ian, I'll kind of you can start, but um, uh, Joshua, please chime in if there's anything you want you wish to add. Is there a good assembly program other than Staden that is in the public domain? I'll ask one question. Public domain, I don't know if there's a whole lot in the public domain, but I don't know what would be the difference necessarily between public domain and the open source free stuff that you can get. If you actually wanted to develop your own assembler, then you might want to, you know, take somebody's public domain software and then modify it. I but, think they uh, may oh, have wow. been meaning, meaning open source. Oh, there's tons of stuff that's free. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, right. that's, there's no barrier there. Your Sigma list, is that available for public use? CEGMA. So the CEGMA list. Yeah, Sigma, the, yeah, that's, yeah, all our software is free. Okay, I'm just taking questions that I plucked up from the from the chat box in, in completely random uh, order. There have been murmurs, came one question about removing mitochondrial sequences before assembly. Is this necessary to improve memory usage and speed? Uh, most of the time when you do an assembly, you don't really have to remove the organelles. They'll just come out as a separate contig. Also, the, there'll be contaminants that can come out, come out as, you know, if, you're, if you've got, if you're sequencing a plant, you probably got aphids on it or something like that. So those will come out as a separate contig. Did you say that RNA-seq should be included even when running DNA? Even when doing, uh, when that was the question was, I think, bacteria. Okay. Yeah, I would say do RNA-seq whenever you're doing genome assembly, you should, if you're doing a genome project, include some RNA. I mean, that's, that's often the part where we think about as the useful bits of the genome or the RNA parts. And a place yeah. in a bacteria where this is important is that bacteria have very small genes sometimes. You can find a small open re reading frame, and you don't know if that's a gene or not. So some people might just threshold, like, anything over 100 amino acids is a gene, anything under is not. So that's not really motivated by anything other than someone's convenience. It would be much better to say that those things that have RNA-seq support are more likely to be genes than those that do not, regardless of how long those are. So I would do an RNA-seq no matter what. All right. Joshua, let me just bring you back in. What yes. you know, Ian went through this wonderful sort of uh, list of uh, you know, do's and don'ts and problems and so on. What, what do you find to be your chief bottleneck during the, the process of your, uh, your assembly work? What's the biggest headache? Well, so so the assembly itself was was fairly easy. I think the biggest bottleneck that we've run into is trying to piece apart the the relevance of different contigs. So in other words, finding a contig with respect to SNP design, ensuring that we're we're within an exon so that um, we're not going to inadvertently jump an intron boundary when we're trying to genotype. That is certainly a bottleneck. Um, I think the other bottleneck is just going back and. Um, kind of trying to make sense of coding sequence alterations um, that are present between the two different morphotypes. Because again, our strategy was to take both the cave and the surface reads, combine them together, and then align. And the advantage of this is that it sort of visually allows you to quickly pull out SNPs, but the downside is that there are going to be a large amount of unrepresented contigs that you have to sort of go through one by one and identify what, you know, if if it's a synonymous change, if it's a non-synonymous change, and mm. um, how that impacts on the structure of the protein. I'd like to get all of your comments about the the uh, g growing prevalence of longer reads. Uh, you, uh, a couple of you mentioned PacBio. Uh, Matthew, mm -hmm. you mentioned Ion Torrent. Uh, I dare say after AGBT next week, we'll be hearing about one or two other uh, potential long read platforms that are about to, or, or on, the, on the verge of being commercialized, which is very exciting. What, presumably that's, a, that's good news for de novo genome assembly, but does, it raise, uh, d does that raise uh, additional problems? Do you, know, do you have to reevaluate steps of your pipelines um, and if you have access to these, to these longer reads? Give, give me your thoughts. Uh yeah, and I'll start uh, with you. Well, I think that some of the things that we've learned is that even if you have a mixture of technologies, your sequence assembler might not use those appropriately. But, you know, the sequence assemblers are getting better over time. And so even if you keep the data exactly as they are, they could improve. And, and mm -hmm. even though they might not be doing a great job right now of incorporating multiple technologies, maybe the next version will. So I think there's, an, there's a good reason to, to think that it could work. We're still waiting for that to happen. But I think that there's a lot of reason to think that a mixture of technologies could, should be very useful, especially 
I mean, right now, PacBio, it seems like it's very expensive, but then the reads are very long and error prone. But there's reasons to think that that actually that a hybrid approach using something that's very long and something very short could actually be very useful. It's hard to build up uh, a genome assembly from things that are just small. And including some other kind of information, like you know mate pairs and those kinds of things, is is useful. And having very long reads would also be useful. So mm -hmm. I think that sequencing technology in the next five years is going to change a lot. We're going to see a bunch of new products out there. So this whole conversation about what we're doing with assembly today is really about today. It could change completely <laughs> in a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Josh and Matthew, any quick comments on the incorporation of long reads? Uh, yeah, we've we've been looking at PacBio pretty pretty extensively here in the last few weeks. Uh, we have a number of data sets and. You know, I think with the long reads, they are more error prone, and it's it's. Uh, I think that the, that the most effective strategy, at least in the near term, will be using another technology like Illumina or their own circularized consensus sequences to essentially clean up the long reads to the point where they can be assembled effectively. Um, it's proving to be a little bit trickier than I think we anticipated. Uh, but it's something that we're continuing to work on, and and uh, if if we can get five KB, three to five KB long reads, you know, for microbial genomes, that vastly reduces the complexity for closing the gaps on a microbial genome. So, uh, we're we're pretty excited about it. Yeah, I I don't have too much to add to the conversation. We we initially decided to do four five four read precisely because they would give us a little bit longer sort of chunks of sequence. Yep. But we are we, we're in the process of performing some tissue-specific and developmental stage-specific RNA sequencing using Illumina. And so we plan to overlay those onto our transcriptome, and, um, you know, we'll see. I, my, my hope is that it will improve our, our overall transcriptome assembly a little bit. Okay. Let me just try to squeeze in a few more questions, and then we'll, we'll have to re reluctantly bring this to a close. Uh, but thank you all for your questions. I apologize if we can't get to all of them. If you're assembling an unknown genome, how much do you need to assemble before reporting to the scientific community? The questioner says, I've seen many reports in the sort of 60 to 90 percent range. Is, are there any conventions or, or thresholds that you need to reach before you feel a, a publication is legitimized? Boy, that's a difficult question. When do you publish it? <laughs> Well, if you're the Human Genome Project, you announce it when it's convenient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, I think, my, yeah. I mean, there, obviously, there are more, more, uh, more and more journals where you know these sort of reports and communications type journals where perhaps uh, the, the the bar is lowered a little bit. Not not in terms of technical quality, but perhaps it gives you an opportunity to. Uh, publish a slightly more preliminary uh, account of the work if there's something to be gained by that. Let's keep pushing on. What, uh, uh, Ian, this came for you. What method would you suggest to assess the quality of a de novo assembly of a metagenome? N50 is bad, I know, but what other measures are there? Information entropy, perhaps? Uh, metagenome is going to be really difficult because there's going to be who knows how many different things are in there. So I think mm -hmm. that one way maybe to, to do that is to try some simulations first to see about what kind of neighborhood you're in, like there's going to be some things that are going to be so rare in that sample that they're going to be very hard to assemble, and you have to decide mm -hmm. on how deep you want to be able to go with that kind of stuff. So I think this yeah, that, is a that, very hard that, problem. It would be hard to comment on that. Yeah, and that, that's something I, I've worked with quite a few different metagenomics sets, and one thing that one approach that we'll take is, you know, if, if it's, you know, say it's viral or bacterial, is we'll assemble it to, you know, a, a full database of genome sequences and just to see how many of the sequences actually can sort to a known genome and then collect the leftovers and de novo assemble just the the leftovers and and try to identify you know potentially unique uh, genomes that are that are in you know that that didn't sort you know with the original assembly so uh, yeah, there's no easy area. answer to it yeah and this is an area i think of very active research right now i think you're going to see a lot of new products coming out from a lot of different places in the next six months or a year. So one thing that you can be sure about with assembly is it's going to get better over time. So if you can wait just a little bit of time, you <laughs> might find out something is a lot better is coming down the pipe. Ian, uh, you touched on the Assemblathon 1 in your presentation. Uh, one question came in, have any new assembly evaluation metrics not part of Assemblathon 1 been developed for uh, Assemblathon 2 that are not dependent on knowing the correct assembly? Well, we're working on a few of those kinds of things, but they're experimental in nature, which means that, I mean, requiring experimental biology, things like optical maps, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So not something that you just simply run some new program and then it tells you if you got the right answer or not, but something where in a, new, in a novel genome, 
you'll have to do some kind of sampling of something else to figure out what's correct or not. I mean, it's, there's only so much you can do with software if you don't know what the answer is. Okay. We had a question about models for storage, database, and annotation updates. Do these updates get maintained in GenBank or only privately is the question. This is an ongoing headache for this uh, particular group. A recent bacterial genome submission took over three months to get deposited into GenBank. Well, I, I, I I'll take that one. I would say that, yeah, maybe it takes you a little bit of time to get into GenBank. That seems like it's too long, but the process of putting it into GenBank and updating it should happen on a regular basis. You should, you know, it should every six months or something like that or every quarter or whatever it is for your particular project, you should be updating the, the records that exist in GenBank. But you should also be updating everything that you do on your own site, obviously, much more often than that. But I don't think that you have to think every single time you make some minor change, you have to upload that to GenBank. Just do that on a periodic basis because that okay. whole procedure, you know, is not all that much fun. To note that the things that go into GenBank, if you put a sequence in there, you sort of own it and you own the annotation on that. So other people can't necessarily modify the GenBank record as it is. They might be able to provide some third-party annotation, but they can't actually right. modify that record. So it is a responsibility of the person who put that sequence in there to keep it updated and change things. Okay. Let's finally talk about error correction tools. What's your opinion about error correction tools? In a de novo genome assembly, would you use them always, in some cases, or never? I would experiment with them because hmm. there are reasons to use error correction because they simplify the De Bruyne graph, but there is reasons that they might actually introduce some kinds of errors. You might end up correcting something that didn't really need correcting. It was a different locus was a paralog, it was a different, it was a heterozygote or something like this, you could destroy the information by correcting the errors. So the reason why error correction is done, though, is to simplify the computation later on. And there may be reasons why you have to do that, just for CPU or memory considerations, mm -hmm. but they may be destructive later on. So if you could do it in a number of different ways, I would probably do it in a number of different ways and then evaluate it later. Mm -hmm. And Matthew, I think we'll give you the last word uh, sure. in, as a courtesy, since uh, thank DNA Style for putting this uh, symposium on. Obviously, we've had phenomenal interest in this subject. Uh, this is the second session we've done on de novo genome assembly just in the last few months. Uh, record attendance today. Uh, what, what, what are the prospects for this field going forward? I mean, I, I think that uh, the prospects, uh, you know, are, are tremendous. You know, I think all of us have had a lot of experience with. For example, reference guided assemblies and, and the realization that you know as the tools become more powerful, we might instead of doing a reference guided assembly, just do a de novo assembly you know on an individual and you know and then you don't have to struggle with that reference bias that you might have for the experiment that you have and you know as these tools the sequencing technologies get better and the software gets better, I think that that's going to be feasible in the future so so I think it's only going to keep growing uh, rapidly right. Well, let's uh, we'll, we'll bring this to a close now. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for, for attending and for all your questions, many of which we weren't able to get to. That doesn't usually happen. It clearly speaks to the excitement and interest in this subject, and it is something we will be uh, pouring over the, uh, the question and answer transcript and uh, endeavoring to put on additional web symposia addressing other aspects uh, to, this, uh, to this field, one, one including bacterial uh, de novo genome assembly and other areas as well. I really want to thank uh, my colleagues at NGS Leaders for hosting this, uh, our sponsors, DNA Star, great job. Our speakers who did a wonderful job, uh, Matthew Kayser from DNA Star, Joshua Gross from the University of Cincinnati, and Ian Korf from UC Davis for all of their presentations and uh, deep expertise in this subject. And most of all, thank you to everyone who's stayed around till the, to the sweet end. Uh, it's been a, been a good session, and uh, we very much look forward to uh, revisiting this subject uh, as soon as uh, it's feasible to provide you with more additional insights into the, uh, the wonderful world of de novo complex genome assembly. I'm Kevin Davis for BioIT. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and bye-bye uh, for now.